there were some scenes, Graham, where I heard you reading and it it impacted me. I mean, and again, I would tell my wife, you know, I wrote it. I knew what was coming, but it still didn't really prepare me. You know, you you embraced um, you embraced the story. Master Jay, got something up, huh? said Smitty, as he struggled to be heard above the clickety-clack of the wheels and the clops of the horse's hooves along the gravel road. What you mean? Bosco asked, as he held tight to the reins of the two-horse team. That boy back there, he usually get grown folks and sell chillins, Smitty replied with a nod toward the rear of the wagon. Yeah, he sure do. Hey, here come Mr. Boo and Riley. Maybe they know. Bosco replied as two riders came into view. The eight slaves in the wagon, five adult males, two women and a boy whose feet dangled out the back, were shackled to each other and to the wagon frame. Echoing screams and anguished faces were etched in the boy's traumatized mind as he rode in silence. He looked down and watched the gravel pass underneath haunted by images of people and places and times, haunted by sounds of laughter and singing and crying and screaming. The screams were strongest. Screams he couldn't ignore. Screams he could feel. I know you're in Florida, but I don't know whereabouts. Where are you? Yeah, I, I live in the Tampa Bay area of Florida, uh, the yeah. west central coast. Um, yeah. Living right, right yeah. south of Tampa. Right. So I have been in right. that area well, once. I, I've visited Tampa once when I was, I think I was 20 years old. So we're talking about a long time ago. And me and a couple of my mates rented a car and we went, we went to Bush Gardens in Tampa. Is that near you? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bush Gardens is in North Tampa. I'm south of Tampa, so it, I would have to drive through Tampa, but I'm I'm familiar with it. Actually, uh, Graham, I was born. I was born in the area. I was born in St. Petersburg, Florida, which yes. is which is right on the coast. Yeah. But right yeah. now I live south of Tampa. Okay. Now the thing the only thing I know about St. Petersburg, even though I haven't been there, my uncle Norman Hughes used to run a hairdressers in St. Petersburg. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's a famous hairdresser there or not, but it was his business and okay. he's retired now, but he used to, he used to do that. He moved from Liverpool to, uh, to Tampa, uh, to, to, sorry, to St. Petersburg. So you grew up uh -huh. there. What, what took you to South Tampa? Um, a very, um, a very circuitous route. Um, I, I was in the Air Force, went to the Air Force, traveled. Japan, um, Las Vegas, Philippines, came back, go with the college. I was still, I came back to St. Pete, um, worked for quite some time, uh, decided to go back to school to become a teacher. Um, began my teaching career in Tampa because I went to University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, came back to Pinellas County, the St. Pete area, taught for about 12 years. Um, I moved to Tampa to teach for about four years. Um, I got married and I moved to Daytona Beach, Florida, which is on the east coast of Florida, uh, to be with my wife. You know, we uh, took care of her, her aged parents and uh, we just recently uh, moved back here. We moved back here in June. Um, I retired, actually retired in June, we moved back here. And so that's how I ended up where I am now. Wow. And along the way, uh, you became a preacher, a, preacher, a preacher as well. Oh, preacher well, as well. yes. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I am an ordained minister. Um, I've been I've been preaching since 2003. Uh, so I just celebrated my 20th anniversary of, of preaching. And uh, I, I did not retire from that. I retired from the teaching every day. But I'm, I'm, I'm still a preacher at heart. And what were you teaching? And what were you teaching? What, what was I teaching? I yeah. was teaching, I taught, yeah. uh, I taught basically fifth grade. I taught fifth grade and I, I went to schools that were considered at risk schools, schools where um, kids had a, you know, the, the community was in a high poverty area uh, where students didn't have the basic backgrounds to succeed in school. 
And so that's where I always, that's where I always went. Anytime I changed a job or changed a school, I always went to that type of school. It was very fulfilling. And, uh, you know, it just, it's just strengthened my sense of purpose of, of giving back to the community and also helping those who may, who may fall through the crack. Yeah. And, and as a yeah. kid growing up in St. Petersburg, well, what kind of stuff were you reading? What was inspiring you? Oh, well, well, most of my general reading came from my job as a teacher. Um, right. Uh, I always had to read for my job, you know, you know, for my I was in computers and all of that. And I read for recreation, um, but I basically read sports things. I was always into sports. Um, but uh, most of my literature reading came from me being a teacher. Um, I had to read so that I can understand what to teach my students. And I think that's where my growth in writing came from. Um, I would I would be reading and I would be like, well, wow, why did they say it that way? Why didn't they say it this way? You know, not knowing that that was the genesis of, of, of God um, inspiring in me to write. Um, so that's what I you know, that's that's where a lot of my writing comes in at. Um, I guess I'm technical in the sense that I've always read nonfiction. I've always read, you know, you know, the informational type of, of reading. Uh, but then when I got to, to teach, I read a lot of fiction, you know, because that's what they that's how we taught students how to read. So yeah. I messed those two together. Yeah. And, and that's where my writing style comes in. at. Well, A Journey Far oh, journey. is a wonderful story. It's a fictional story, but it's historical <laughs> fiction. It's set in a particularly important time, certainly for American history, but also for world history. How did you get interested in history? Again, uh, teaching, teaching okay. uh, I, in, in the United States, most of the elementary schools, the teacher teaches all the subjects. You know, right, so okay. I taught reading, writing, uh, math, science and social studies. And I found that during the social studies part of my lessons, um, I really, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed um, getting more details of the past. Uh, we use a lot of narrative kind of uh, nonfiction in, in the reading. And so I started being able to recall some of the things I had learned on my own. And I also um, became more interested in that time period. You know, um, um, in a lot of ways, um, the, t the 2020s are mirroring that time period that time not not we're talking Civil about War, for not. those who don't know yeah the, the the time the time of the height of slavery in the united states yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah but you and, know and and I, how, I, I how are the current it. times mirroring that then well 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 um for for me it's it's the it's the politics um Politicians in the 1860s were saying one thing and doing another, and it appears as though they're doing the same thing today. They're saying one thing and doing another, or they're they're saying one thing to this group and saying one thing to this group to get what they want. And um, it just it just reminded me of not only how far this country has gone has come, because I mean I have to admit that um, you know the things are better. But it also highlights how far we have to go and that if we're not careful, we may start going back the wrong way. So yeah. um, that's what kind of and it was so interesting, uh, Graham, that when I first started writing the book uh, back in the early 2000s, um, that wasn't that wasn't part of my that wasn't part of my view. Uh, but lately it it has become it, it's it really is and i think that's one of the things that makes a journey far a very timely is yeah. that i hope people yeah. see some of the similarities between james's the main character's existence and the existence we're having now yeah yeah, yeah. i get yeah. that one of the things yeah. because one it's so wonderfully researched and we'll talk about the research, research in a bit but something yeah. i read in there something for the first I, time yeah was that abraham lincoln you know the revered president possibly the greatest president the united states has ever had mm -hmm. it turns mm -hmm. out that 
in your book, you give an example of where when he was campaigning, he said one thing, but then when he became president, things suddenly changed. So even yes. Abraham Lincoln was not necessarily mm -hmm. to be trusted because bottom line, he was a politician. I'd never seen that or heard of that anywhere else before, apart from your book. You know, and, and the thing about it, Graham, and I, and I, I, I do blogs as well on my website. And um, one of the things I've learned is that as a historical fiction writer, I have to let the fiction, I mean, I have to let the history drive the fiction, right. not the other way around. You oh, know, yeah. that point you, you're making. Um, in my story, when I was writing it, I still had the belief that Lincoln was just so anti-slavery, so pro-African-American. And I used to do a lot of research in the libraries. And oh. when Google came about and Wikipedia came about, it made my, my research so much more efficient. And I remember um, one night and I was, I was doing some studying of it and I was, you know, James at that time in my book, the way I was writing it, James was James revered Lincoln like he revered Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, you yeah. know, on that same level. Yeah. Yeah. And then I happened to yeah. take a I happened to find a copy of his of, of, of Lincoln's inaugural address, uh March fourth, eighteen sixty one. Right. And I'm I'm reading it and I'm saying, hey, you know, I must be tired. I must be misreading this. I went to Google and I pulled out something from the Library of Congress, from the Smithsonian. See, and that's the part the power of Google. I, I don't know the, which first one I got, but I wanted to verify what I was reading. So I pulled like four or five different sources. And you think Smithsonian uh, Library of Congress, they're going to have everybody had the same inaugural address. And in it, Lincoln called slaves property. Yeah, and, that and is that so disappointing, to... isn't it? Even even now, even yeah. learning that now, it's so disappointing. <laughs> well, well, and 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 that's the challenge, uh, uh, Graham. That's one of the challenges that I had was, um, you know, how much history to to tell. You know, how much history to share. Um, you know, back then they the, the Republican Party was founded by the abolitionists who were staunchly anti-slavery. Yeah. And Lincoln was their yeah. first presidential candidate. Yeah. And so yeah. to me, Lincoln used the Republican Party to get elected, even though and, and I don't I don't I'm still I'm still not sure. Again, I have to be real careful because this is history and there's a lot of nuances that, you know, I'm not a history professor. You know, I yeah. just I study, I research yeah. for my book. Uh, but I knew that I was, I knew I had to change my story. You know, that wow. changed the tenor wow. of my story. That changed James' attitude toward President Lincoln. And I wrote it, we know what happened, right? But in 1861, James doesn't know what's going to happen in 62, 63, 64. Uh, so I wrote it with that part in mind. And um, it came, it comes out a little bit at the end of a journey for a beret, but in my in my next book, and by the way, there's four, you know, I have um, uh, four in the series. In the next book, it's going to really come to head because again, you know, there's a lot of documents, there's a lot of there's a lot of historical data that I'm going to be pulling into my fiction, yeah. and um, yeah, you know, just just wondering then what James was thinking and even now, you know, in the country now, in the United States now, there's a lot of there's a there's a push to to ignore or to change history. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's important that books like this uh be be uh released and shared with the world, not just the United Absolutely. States to understand Absolutely. understand that, you know, History has happened. You can't undo history, but I really believe that we can make our us. We can allow us, us to have a better future by learning from the history, and so yeah. that's that's you yeah. know that's where I see myself as 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 a as an author. Um, I try to entertain with the fiction. I make the fiction realistic. 
Um, but I also am true to the history. I'm not yeah. going to ignore yeah. a history fact because it doesn't fit into my story. Um, I will change my story to fit yeah. the history, to fit the historical yeah. fact. Okay. But you've written it so well because at that moment, James is filled with hope of, of a new dawn, of a better America. And then his dreams of that are shattered and you write it so. And I could really feel for him. It was so well written that it was, you know, as a narrator, it was, it was, so, it was so powerfully done. So I, I, I think, in, in fact, I think for me, because I'd been on the same journey as James, I mean, same journey, I'd followed the journey of James throughout and what he'd been through. But then to get to that point near the end and then to have his hopes dashed, it actually made the book even more powerful and even more important, I think. So thank you for that, because I, I think that was yeah, great. And it, and it happens in several happens in several instances. Um, yeah. um, you know, James being yeah. on, on, a, on a plantation in the South, you know, he doesn't really know any current events. And when yeah. he finally, I'm not yeah. going to give her too much of the book. No, no, no spoiler. No, no, no spoiler. Yeah, yeah. But when he finally gets to the North and learns about the fugitive slave law, because yeah. he always assumed when I got to the North, I'm going to be free. He's going to be free. But yeah. that He's wasn't the case. Free. And so, yeah. you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. well, I'm, I, you know, Graham, I'm glad because that was, that was a powerful point for me as a writer. I yeah. mean, in, 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 yeah. in, I think, I think it happened like about 2016, 2017, when okay. I learned this okay. and, you know, I mean, my thoughts of Lincoln changed. Yeah. And mine I mine have too myself, now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but I kept asking myself, was that fair? You know, I mean, the times he lived in, the times we live in now. But you know, I couldn't deny the truth. You know, once I researched it, and you know, I got four, five, six sites that all were saying the same thing. It's like, you know, it has to be true. You yeah. know, then I started asking myself yeah. the questions, why? Yeah. And yeah. I still haven't gotten those answers yet, other than, other than politics. Other you than know, yeah, so, he was he was saying you know, what would get him elected, yeah, which they all tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking yeah, about yeah, like yeah. you're talking about, you talked about like, that when, when you came across that in 2016. So how many years of research went into this book then? Well, well, you know, um, I was in college at University of South Florida, Tampa. Well, not say I was going back to be a teacher, and. Um, I wrote a I wrote a short story about a slave escaping. Uh, it was for a class I was taking in education. Uh, they wanted us to write a story so that we could go through the process so that when we teach our kids how to write, we yeah. you know we've done it ourselves. And I mean, Graham, I took maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes to write it and send it out and um I got the acclimates, accolades from my classmates and by my teacher, my professor. I'm thinking I'm this. Well, I'm one an A, you know. <laughs> and so uh, it, it hit me. I've had other people tell me I've been a good writer, but I never considered it. And then when I started teaching and I started reading more literature, you know, you know the fiction, and I kept saying to myself, "Well, I wouldn't. I would do it this way." You know, well, this is kind of bland. You know, I would do it. This, and I started realizing that I was starting to think as a writer. Mm -hmm. And so um, probably by, 20, by 2002, 2003, I first started putting, you know, pencil to paper. Um, kept going. I did, a, I did a rough draft, probably took me three or four years. I sent it off to publishers. Uh, you know, at those times we had to send it by, you know, by mail, mm -hmm. and, and, and we mm -hmm. had to we had to include a self-addressed stamp envelope. And <laughs> it by six months, yeah. yeah. And six months later, they start coming in one by one. No, 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 and no. I kept going, and again, all I could say was it was it was the spirit of the Lord on me because. Every time I would get down and frustrated and ready to give it up, something would happen or somebody would say something that just kept me going. Um, 
I was tell I was telling you about Google and Wikipedia. That's when it exploded, because right. I mean I would right. be in in the library, um, at the University of South Florida campus, and researching um, you know books on writing and and books on history, and uh, it was it was it was tedious. And then when Wikipedia and Google came along and I learned the power of it, I mean, I could ask Google a question and it would give me documents I needed. Right. And I didn't have to go right. through page after page after page to find it. So so my, my research became more, I think, more powerful. And it also helped drive the story. Like I was saying with the issue with James, you know, yeah. I didn't I didn't realize yeah. um, that what I was writing would be incorrect until I found the data. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but yeah, so about 2002 is when I started. And, um, you know, 20 years later, um, and again, and I am, I am an independent self-published author. Um, yeah. I was still getting rejection yeah. letters. People were saying that, it, oh, it wasn't a book for the time. And they were giving me different reasons, but it was the same answer, no. And so, and even with that, with the technology now, you know, it makes it so much easier for a writer, an independent writer, to, to publish their book and yeah. it be a book that people can't tell that it's published, that, that it's independently published. You know, yeah. that's what I wanted. I wanted yeah. it um, so that if people look at my book and look at the book next to me, they could not tell that mine didn't come from a big publishing house. Yeah. But uh, but hopefully, yeah. the, hopefully the writing is better. So the writing is better. It really is better. Yeah. It's, no, it's wonderfully written, and when I was reading it, it had a a cinematic feel to it, more so than a book. It was like it was like a a full sensory experience for me because it was so well written, and the character of James was so real. And I don't think I don't think the term audio book does it justice. I think it should be called an ear movie. <laughs> your book um, <laughs> uh, ear, ear movie ear an ear movie, movie. Okay. Yeah. so it's a movie for the that. ears ear it's a movie for the Ooh, ears man, that's what it ear is movie. yeah so wow, you, know, you know did you know Graham I may have to on my website I may have to put your review and I may have to say <laughs> Graham Mac said, don't call it an audio book call it an ear movie and it's so interesting I didn't grow up as a writer reading books i grew up as a writer looking at tv and and creating my book based on what i saw yeah you know like i like even i do it now too i would be looking at a movie with my wife and i and uh i'll be imagining how would i describe the background i mean you know i mean the dialogue it's a dialogue you know, how would I describe this background? How would I describe what just happened? You know, how much would I tell an, uh, an audience? How much would I not tell them? So I've been doing that for the, probably the past 15 years, you know? So yeah. again, becoming a writer changed the way I, I look at TV. Yeah. You know, it changes the way yeah. I, 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 look at the, I look at the world. I mean, I'm looking now where I am. I'm in my backyard. And I'm looking at things and I'm like, okay, how would I describe this? And a lot of times I would just jot things down. And I think that uh, you, were, you were talking about the movie aspect of it, the moving of the writing. That's kind of how I see things. Yeah. You know, I, and, yeah. and, and being a fifth grade teacher for writing for, for most of my teaching career, you know, I always told the kids, you know, show not tell, show not tell. And but I didn't realize, in the essence, I was teaching myself show not tell, because yeah. I do. I, I want. Yeah. I, I wanna. I wanna place people in James's environment, and and James's environment is very uncomfortable. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's very uncomfortable, and so that was another one of my challenges. You know, I got like I said before, I'm a preacher, uh, but some of the some of the scenes had to be written if it was going to be factual. Some of the yeah. language had to yeah. be used if it was going to be factual. And and that was a challenge. But I, I you know, I just said to myself, you know, I'm, I'm going to write this book and I want to write it 
for the correct reasons. I want to write it to to share with the world what I think happened in the first part of the of the 19th century in the United States. And I want to understand. I want I want you to be able to celebrate James's victories because you've experienced his you know his 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 struggles, his challenges. Yeah. Well, you paint some vivid, vivid pictures in it of some brutal incidents. Yeah. And you mentioned the language, and the thing that surprised me specifically was you used the N word in the book. You uh -huh. use it in context, but with all that that word represents, how tough a decision uh -huh. was that? You mentioned that you, you had to do that. How, how much soul searching uh -huh. did you have to do before you decided it, I'm going to use it in there? It is. It still is. It still is, Graham. Uh, uh, difficult. Um, I remember listening to you read the words and I'm like, oh, but there was, to me, there was no other way around it. You know, if I, if I hadn't have used it, I think I would have did a disservice to the story. Yeah. And I didn't use it as a term of endearment, you know, no. like people are and, 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 and you know, prone to use now they are used it as a term of endearment. There's nothing. There's nothing. Um, there's nothing good about the word. Um, it's 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 a it's a vile word. It's a it's a degrading word. And um, as I'm doing blogs, I'm I'm doing um, I'm doing YouTube videos myself, and I'm reading extras from the book. And if I come to that word, I won't say it. Yeah. I'll just say in yeah. or an, another word again as a preacher. Uh, when they when they use a certain curse, yeah, where they use yeah. God's name in the curse, I don't, I won't say that word. Yes, I wrote it, but I yeah. won't say it. Yeah. I, you know, you know, I'll say the GD word. Yeah, uh, but yeah. again, but the thing is, in the book, you're not yeah. saying it. The book, the characters right. are saying it, and that's what those, that's how those characters would have spoken. So that helps that's with the, the reality. The historical reality. And, yeah, and and, and um, you know, I made a point of that because again, when I started my final review of it, like in maybe 2015, 2016 is when I did my final major rewrite of it, and I started looking at um, if I was going to use any kind of bio words, I was going to have to have it in a character's mouth because yeah. I wasn't going to say it. Yeah. And but yeah. the brutal events were still on me because, yeah. you know, as a writer, yeah. I have to describe it. So. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 There is there is, yeah, a, there is a lot of there are a lot of brutal events in there. Uh, there's a particular a tip. I don't want to give too much away, but, you know, James was a slave. So inevitably he got he got whipped. And uh, the way you describe it the the torture of it and the just the just how disgraceful it was just a, a disgraceful way to treat another human being regardless of what they'd done wrong and uh, in, in most cases they hadn't done anything that des well nobody deserves something like that it was uh, exactly, exactly. it really was vivid i think the thing that surprised me the most because i knew you were a preacher was there is a sex scene in there i mean it's not it's not graphically <laughs> described <laughs> but a preacher wrote a sex scene and i had to get my head around that you know you know graham graham i don't i don't consider it a sex scene okay I it's it, a love making scene it two people in love yeah consummating their love yeah you know because okay. there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of sex scenes been written all over the world i mean yeah. let's face it and, and yeah. for a lot of time that's that's the driving force behind those books. Yeah. And I remember um, as I was writing it, I kept trying to think, okay, well, so how far am I going to go? You know, and then I asked myself this question, well, why am I putting it in here? Yeah. And yeah. Um, it was uh, one of my editors called, uh, uh, said my, um, my book, um, there's some instances where I, follow another character who lives in another place and the um editor used the term juxtaposition mm -hmm. you know describe two people different areas that are similar well yeah. 
yeah. that scene I wrote, those scenes I wrote, it was uh, just a position to a reality of that of that division. And right. again, I'm not going to get into right. it a lot. I want the readers to, to read and to you know decide for themselves. But I wanted to show the difference between being forced to do something and doing it freely, and yeah. and the and the differences yeah. in them. So. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I did. And um, I had a couple of people, you know, ask me about it. And I'm like, well, yeah, and this is why I did it. They're like, wow, you know, and they know me and they're like, wow, I would have never thought. Well, one one person <laughs> said that, how, how did she put it? Um, I wrote it so well. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but you are, you a minister. I mean, I said, so you think ministers don't have sex? <laughs> I'm, I'm married. I, I, I'm I am married, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but it was just so interesting. And but again, I still think though there were limits. There was there was there was there was a line I wouldn't cross. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, but, yeah. but but as I you said earlier, it, it's line, an important you know, part part of the story because there is another element to to life on that particular plantation which is quite shocking and this juxtaposition to what romantic love is compared to what was going on it absolutely it, it makes it even it makes it even it makes what was going on even more shocking because of the difference between that and romantic love and and, and yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah I, I i i understand it but you know on the face of it for a preacher to write <laughs> what is a sex scene was uh, uh, um wow you know this is a, this is a brave man and, and and you know and you know uh graham um when i was doing my uh What's it called? BSAC codes, uh, B I S A C. B and again for my for my listeners here, BSAC is is how people find your book. You know right. what category right. did you want the book to be in? And I, you know, obviously I had African American fiction, I had historical fiction, um, I had fiction. Um, I used keywords slavery, um, you know, nineteenth uh, century America. I'm talking. Yeah, Native century America, but but and so they got down to Christian fiction, and again, this this juxtaposition that my main editor told me about, you know, because I was I just did it; it wasn't intentional, but I did it. The Bible, and one group read the Bible and interpreted it in a way that justified what they were doing. Yeah, and another yeah. group yeah. read the same yeah. Bible. And justified what they were doing, and said it supported what they were doing. Yeah. But so yeah. there was, there is a spiritual element in it. Again, you know, you can't be a minister without putting spiritual elements in there. But I, I would not use that as a, as a bisac, a, a bisac code, because right. I didn't want anybody right. to think, in a, you know, almost like what you were saying. You know, well, this is a, it's a Christian book, so it shouldn't have this and this and this and this in it. Um, when I look at the Bible, um, there's a lot of harsh things going on in the Bible. Oh, the Old Testament! Hey, goodness, Old Testament. Me. goodness me! But oh, and and, and even, even the New Testament, there was there was some there, there was a lot of there's a lot of it, and not to diminish the Bible, the Word of God, because that's you know that's that's what I believe in wholeheartedly. But I also recognize that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, life as we know it consist of these all these things that kind of mesh and blend and and you it's kind of it's kind of a lot of time you have to kind of find your way through it um with um you know uh, with with the sex scenes with the with the violence with the horror with the language with the brutality uh we know we know with the word of god being used different ways you know i wanted to I really wanted people to experience what James was experiencing. I mean, I yeah. really, I really wanted people to be confused, like like James. I wanted people to be frustrated, like James. Yeah. I mean, hopefully not frustrated yeah. when they close the book and don't read it. I <laughs> mean, because uh, and let me and let me and, and, and let me tell your readers, James does make it to the north. 
Okay, yeah. so if you're stuck on a particular part where he's still a slave, he's gonna make it. You know, just <laughs> take, you know, you know, just go and take the journey with them. Take the journey with them. But you know, I wanted to make sure that what my characters were feeling and what I was feeling writing it, what you were feeling, um, uh, but when you were doing your narration, um, it's intentional because I think that's important for the story, so that yeah. when James starts having his success, um, you know, you're happy for him. You you yeah. you are actually yeah. you you're actually I guess the term I want to say is emotionally invested, maybe. Yes. Uh, yes. One of my, one, although, one of my oh, although none of us can was, possibly yeah. imagine what it must be like to be a slave. Right. Just how soul uh -huh, destroying right. it must be every minute of every hour of every day. It's always there. Mm -hmm. But you manage to you manage to tell James's story and through James's words and his thoughts too. And you can you can empathize so much with it. You know, it would it would be insulting to anyone who's been a slave to say you you know what it would be like. You don't. No one can know that unless they've been through exactly, it. Exactly, but exactly. but you can empathize with it and also see the complete injustice complete of it. Injustice. And then to mm -hmm. see people in power, like for instance the master, justifying slavery being right because it says so in the Bible. I mean, mm -hmm. and and James for him, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but a lot of, a lot of how James copes with things is through reading, and through reading the Bible and the Word of God, and and his faith helps him through, and then to find exactly. that the the master is justifying the appalling behaviour of the overseers, etc., on the plantation, by by using the Bible, the one of the very things that's helping James cope with it is another great juxtaposition <laughs> in the writing. You yeah. know what I mean? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and, you. And, 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 and as you know, a preacher yourself, and as a man of color, how do you interpret that part of the Bible? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, see, you know, to me, I had to learn. Um, when I first, and I never sought to be a preacher. It wasn't one thing. It wasn't something that I envisioned myself doing. You know, God called me, and I'm not going to get into how He called me, but He called me. He made it clear, and so. One of the first things I started doing was studying the Bible. I mean, I read it, but I didn't really study it. And all of the things that are in it, one of the things I picked up from the Bible that I think is in my story is that is the journey God has us on. You know, um, God's journey for us is, 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 I believe, is unique and individual for each of us. Um, in order for us to get to where he want us to go, where he purpose for us to go, there's things we have to go through. And, you know, do you let the things that knock you down keep you down or do you get back up? Do you let the things that are hard stop you or do you keep pushing your way through? Because, again, and again, there's multiple characters in my story that are living that kind of life. You know, I didn't want to. There was no thought in my mind to make a touchy Philly, you know, story where everything, you know, uh, I almost, I almost said this one network, this one network is known for touchy Philly stories. My wife loves them. And uh, I sit there with her and it's like, it's always, it, it always works out in the end, you know, you know, and I guess, I guess there's a, I guess, I guess there's a place for that kind of, that kind of literature, that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, entertainment. And so I'm not knocking it. Um, but it's something to be said for somebody who had to overcome a lot yeah. and yeah. um and and come out and come out positive you know yeah. so easy to yeah. come out jaded so easy to come out angry um and again not giving away any of the story i don't believe uh but yeah, like i said james makes it through um with the help of others um and um i think that i think the story is going to be satisfying for you know for most of my readers um yeah. you know i want them yeah. to you know i can say it experience as much as we can like you said much as we can about it but i also want them to recognize perhaps even in their own lives you know the struggles they may have and and yeah. you know um yeah. you know questioning 
questioning their purpose, questioning why God would let this happen or why God would let that happen. Um, and understanding that, you know, um, a lot of what happens to them is not as important as what you let it do to you. Yeah. You know, there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of scenes out there that's similar to what I just said. Um, um, I think one writer puts, um, something about attitude. Um, I think it's, uh, a preacher swindle um what happens in his life is is 10 percent what happens and 90 percent how he reacts to it and, and that's the um, bit I you can control is how you react you can't always control what happens to you you can you reduce can. the odds of something bad happening but you can't completely control well, what happens to you, you but you have control. complete control of how you how you deal with it that's on you how you Yes, how do you act? And when the opportunities come to get you better, do you take advantage of them? So, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean to preach today. I didn't mean to no, preach today. No, that's okay. Sorry. So, so where does the character of James the come character? from? Is there somebody you know, or is it something within you that you bring out? to, to, to Because he's such a likable, hard-working, honest, down-to-earth guy who just keeps getting hit by these terrible circumstances mm. but he always faces well, them head on and deals with them well you know i i um in one of my blogs um i do talk about inserting me into my story mm -hmm. inserting me into my story and so a lot of times when i'm doing when i was doing the the, the narrative you know um sometimes it would come out and I was I didn't realize it I was I was pulling from my own experiences and um I've been, obviously I've never been a slave uh but I have been I have I have been been discriminated against I have been called the n-word uh I have been looked at like I was lower than somebody else you know so those things I think most African Americans can relate to that, um, but I'm also a stutterer. Uh, actually, I still stutter, and um, I, um, in my stuttering, I it was it was terrible in elementary school. I could not even complete a sentence. I would have never given this interview, uh, Ben. <laughs> Uh, but I still am a stutterer. People would be surprised, you know. They say you up there preaching, you don't stutter. I said, well, yeah. There's times when I stutter, times when I don't. Uh, but in my in the book, I put a stutterer in yes, the story. You did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And I did it because one, I think people would used to look at me like I was. I don't want to say not intelligent, but less intelligent. If I couldn't just talk, then there must be something wrong with me. Then, and this was way back in the in the in the seventies, sixties, and seventies. And so, this character, even though he stutters, he's probably one of the most wisest characters um, in the book. Yeah. You know, uh, and yeah. so he has a lot of knowledge. He has a lot of understanding of of life. Um, and then. Um, Coupling that with James, how James educates himself, um, I used to stutter so bad that I became an introvert. I would barely, you know, talk. I would be in class. I would know the answer, but I was afraid I was going to stutter and people were going to let me, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I actually um, had a chance to read um, a dictionary to increase my vocabulary so that I could exchange words. I don't know if you you guys um, in, in England have, um, uh, what was the name of the, this, this cartoon series? Looney Tunes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warner Brothers, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, Porky the Pig. Yeah. Yeah, well, Porky the Pig taught me a valuable lesson. Because Porky, that's what he did. He would stutter on a word and just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And then he would latch on to a synonym that he could say. 
<laughs> and Graham, yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. Wow. That's what I did. Yeah. I know that's where my vocabulary comes from. Because yeah. as a child, yeah. and again, one of our neighbors, uh, they gifted us with a set of encyclopedias. I know your readers may not know what encyclopedias are. They, you know, they, they, you know, you know, they've gone with the dinosaur, uh, but also a dictionary. Yeah. And I purpose to um, learn as many words as I can. I know I tell people I, I, I have this, I have this, this mental rolodex in my head. I've done it several times here talking to you. Right. Where I would be talking and I know there's a word I may stutter on, so I change the word. I use another word. And so those two characteristics of me are, are in my story. Yes. So yes. When, you know, when you when you're asking about that, and I know I, I go on some websites, and um one of them I really like is writers helping writers, and they'll be talking about things, and I'll I just interject it, you know. Um you know, putting yourself in the story, but not you totally in one character. Yeah, spread you know, it out. Yeah. Part, <laughs> parts of me are in all different kind of characters, you know? And um, um, so, you know, with, with James, um, James just grew. He, he, I can say he was, he was in my first story that I wrote, the first one I started out with, he was the main character. Yeah. And I started out with him escaping to the north. Well, you know from the book, there's a lot going on before he escapes to the north. All that was added. Because and it takes so, a lot to get to the north from being on a plantation in the south, you know, thanks that, to Harriet and, Tubman and, and, and others was, like her. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in um I was I was teaching. So I was teaching elementary school kids and I was around them from you know second grade to fifth grade. And I saw how they matured, how they, you know, you know, um, how they developed. And so, when I was writing the the beginning of it, <laughs> I kept looking at these kids that I knew, my nieces and nephews, and how they went from barely speaking to speaking to getting cognitive thoughts together to growing up. And and so I wanted to make sure that as I worked with James in that part, that James wasn't this prodigy that you know you know you know that just knew all from the beginning. I didn't yeah, want he, that. he had to learn yeah, it from scratch. Had to learn it from scratch. He had to learn it from scratch. And you could see, hopefully, my readers can see the stages of development uh, with James in there. So, but there's an educational element to it as well. That if you want to rise above your station in life education is the key and you've got that there with him you know reading webster and the other things there's a little moral there too along the way which yeah, is nice right. uh -huh, yeah and and you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because there's a difference between being intelligent and being educated yeah a lot of these characters a lot of these slaves were intelligent yeah but they weren't educated yeah. So their 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 language, and I don't mean bad language. I'm talking about their vocabulary, wasn't as extensive as James. Well, well they weren't because allowed James to read. Like, That's how oppressed they were. They weren't even allowed to read, and without being able to read, you can't be educated. But, but you can be intelligent. Yeah. And I think that's you know I didn't want I didn't want to preach that, but somebody came to me and said. Um, I think they they jumped ahead to read about James um, as he you know went went you know to the north, and they were saying, well, you know, you know, you know, um, that wasn't realistic. Mm -hmm. They said, but then as they went back and read the book and went through the journey with James, they realized, well, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people even like now in 2024, we got a lot of people out out here. Um, uh, Graham that are in that are in dire straits that are very intelligent people. Yeah. They just never been educated. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. and so, you know, you know, you asked me about where these characters come from and those kind of things hit me and it wasn't like I thought about it. It just as I was writing it, it came to me. You know, I want to have characters in my book that 
um, exhibit the the culture that we live in, the times we live in, and and yeah, um, education versus being intelligent. You know, somebody who's not educated who who under who's undereducated, but that doesn't mean that they are not intelligent. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I look at that and, and that helped me in my teaching. I had students that people would say, oh, but I, I, child, I can't learn or no, no, I, I, I'm not I'm not hearing it. And I, did I have to teach them in a different way? Yeah. Did they learn? Yes, they did. And, and so, that's all that matters, isn't it? That they, learn. Yeah. they learn. That they learn. I mean, you know, if they learn by standing up, I had one one little boy. Um, he drove me crazy in my class. He was a, I had a fourth grade class and he would just bang, he would, he would just tap on his desk the whole day. Just tap. Oh my goodness, I got to get you to stop. You know, very, very, you know, he was intelligent, but he wouldn't do any work. And, you know, Graham, I had to, I had to figure something out. And I, this, you may see this in later in one of my stories later. Um, he, um, I just looked at him one day, a couple of days, I just looked at him and I realized it wasn't malicious. It was, it was habitual. It was what he did. Mm-hmm. So let's say I came into his classroom and I told him, I said, Hey man, I said, I bought you some drums. Yeah. He's like, yeah. Really? He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. I said, you're driving me crazy. I said, here they are. And I said, I said, these are special air drums. And he like, oh really? I said, yes, I got you the bass drum. I said, you see the, the snare? And he said, he said, oh yeah, I see the symbol. I said, okay, I said, I'm gonna move all these over here to you and you play these air drums as much as you want. <laughs> he was, I mean, he would be going and then I guess he would, whatever that did for him, it would maybe calm him down. Yeah. And then he would, he would yeah. work. Great. And, right. and I had a right. silence back in my class. And the thing about it is about a year ago, this is, must have been about 10 years ago, a year ago, this young man came up to me in a restaurant in St. Pete. I yeah. didn't recognize him. He was actually taller than I was then. But he told me who he was. And uh, he thanked me for helping him. He said, you know, he was in college. And, and you know, so this intelligence versus education this i guess from an educational instruction standpoint um you know how do we view people who learn differently yeah yeah you know and and so again all this all this gets into my book you know i it's that i was yeah, worried that. That i was yeah. i was worried that it became too preachy too you know that but I don't think I made it a point to say that's what I was doing, but I think if people, once people read my book and put it down, they're going to say, yeah, yeah, this character, I never thought he would do what he did, but I could see now he always had the ability. He was yeah. just different. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the world we live in. You know, it really is. It's it's amazing, uh, it's amazing the book because there's so many layers so many to layers. it and so many reasons to like it and it was an absolute joy to narrate and I thank you for choosing me to narrate it for you. Um, it was an awesome responsibility and now it, it feels like even more so knowing how many years it that you put into it and how uh, the dedication yeah, yeah. the large part of your life is in this book and it's mm-hmm. so humbling for me to, to think that you chose me to read it because uh i really really got into the book and many conversations at the end of the day when my wife would say well how was your day and say oh wow there's this scene and and i'd be talking about you know the, the stuff that that had been going on in, in james's journey and uh, mm-hmm. it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. And, and thank you so much, AJ Sam, for, for letting me be n- your narrator. How did you find the process of turning it into an audio book? Um, some of it was surprising. Most of it, I kind of figured how it would be. Um, it was so interesting. I, I would have never thought 
I would have never thought I would have had an English gentleman <laughs> as my narrator. I, Tell I, such an American story. You know, yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 not only that, but it, it was it was when I was doing it and I sent out some applications for the for auditions. And um, I think I told you this. I had five. I had. I must have got 20, 25 uh, auditions. And so I broke it down to five. The five I like. You were, you were one of the top five. And again, doing my doing my marketing research, um, I understood that my audience was going to be uh, probably sixty, maybe sixty five percent women. Um. I talked to people who like audio books and I asked them, you know, about the narrator. They said, well, this one person said she had a hard time because the narrator, the voice bothered her. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So I had these five. I let about 10 people, male and female, listen to these five auditions. And I had them email me, you know, their top three. Okay. And, uh, okay. Actually, you were an overwhelmingly choice. It, it, it made it easy. Okay. Um, okay. I think I told you, though, you weren't my first choice. Oh, you told me. You told oh, me, you yeah. Told I me. thought, yeah. geez, yeah. I better do a good job on this. <laughs> but, 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 but what it was was that, you know, again, you know, part of the marketing, part of being an independent publisher is that you have to understand, I had to learn that, you know, my – my, my market, my audience, you know, if it's going to be this demographic, then I have to make sure that whoever I have do the audio book, if they're receptive to it, you know, if they turn off the book because um, they don't like the narrator, then, you know, I've kind of defeated the purpose. Yeah. So, and it wasn't like the other people were, weren't good. Um, uh, I like how you, kept up with me you 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 were you were timely um we had to get the time thing down yeah i, I, I learned yeah. that i learned that i had to get up early in the morning to send you an email because if i waited till the afternoon you would be doing something else you know yeah so we yeah. got that down yeah. Yeah. uh interestingly enough and i tell my wife this um i say neither or either you say neither or either <laughs> And I remember when you first said it, I almost corrected you, and and but you said it in several places. And I said, you know, that may be just the way he talks. And right. you know, either and neither, neither or either, they're the same word. So yeah. I, but those kind yeah. of little nuances um, is is something that that I didn't anticipate. Um, there was some scenes, Graham, where I heard you reading, and it. It impacted me. I mean, and again, I'll tell my wife, you know, I wrote it. I knew what was coming, but it still didn't really prepare me. You know, you you embraced um, you embraced the story. You, you you really did, and you um, brought it to a, a meaning that I, I hope my readers do. You know, I I, I don't know about people who read the text, who read online, who listen. Um, that's why I wanted that third option um, because a lot of people, you know, in this day and age, they get the information in the auditory or, or visual kind of message, TV, radio, that kind of thing. So that the way of reading print is going away. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that the audio book can actually bring people back to the print form because sometimes, you know, they may struggle with some words or some scenarios, but when they hear it read to them, and it's almost like, I don't want to say my readers are children, but it's almost like when you're young and, and, and somebody reads you a story. Yeah. And it allows yeah. your mind to wonder because you don't have to focus on looking at the words. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that that's what the audio book format does for a lot of people. It, it, yeah. it frees them up yeah. to really embody themselves in the, in the story. Um, I know there were some scenes, I mean, you know, I almost didn't, I almost didn't listen to it. I, 
you know, as a writer, I knew what was coming. I knew what was coming. But I'm like, no, I got to experience this. And, and, and so, you know, you did a fantastic job. You actually, you really brought my book to life. And I appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking forward um, to to the next one. Um, I'm hoping for a summer release on the next stage of James's journey. And um, I don't want to give too much. Uh, I will say that in the next stage, he he survives the Civil War. I okay. think I just I do yeah. that oh, because again wow. I want people to wow. yeah 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 I want yeah because you know this stage here goes up to the Civil War and next one he survives it and that's all I say. Well, it is a fabulous well, book. It's only part one, and the word it's it's Ibera is the Ibera. word. Is, is that how you say yes. it? And it's, 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 well, and it's, and this is the thing about it because again, I did my I did my research. Uh, the, the Yoruba language was the predominant language in West Africa during the yeah. during the eighteen yeah. hundreds, and um, a lot of the slaves that were brought over from West Africa uh, in the Middle Passage um, that was their language. Yeah, and so yeah, I just chose that. And but even with that, going on Google, going on Google Translate. I had two or three different pronunciations of this word. Right. Right. You know, I chose Iberia. Right. That's right. that's what I chose. Iberia. Yeah. Uh yeah. and and, and, and it, it means beginnings. Uh but I liken it to in America an accent. You know, you hear somebody say a word in New England. Yeah. And you see yeah. you hear them say it in Chicago, and you hear them say it in Alabama. It may not sound the same, but it'll be the, the same, same word. word. Yeah. I, so yeah. So yeah. so that's how I took it, and so I just I just made a decision to um, to um, use that. You know, when people ask me what the word is, you know, I say Iberi, but you may hear mm -hmm. somebody else pronounce it mm -hmm. differently. But the, mm -hmm. the 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 meaning mm -hmm. of it, beginnings, is the same. So yeah. each one of my uh, yeah. subsequent books I'm going to be writing, they're going to have as a subtitle um, a, a, a language, a language, oh, excuse me, a subtitle from the Yoruba language. Right. Okay. So you've right. got the origin yeah. there as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is a wonderful start to what is going to be clearly a wonderful series. And I hope we can work together on many more because it really was a, a, a wonderful experience. It was great working with you. The writing is superb. And I read a lot of audiobooks. The writing on this one is just superb. You paint such vivid pictures. And it's not just that. The story is an amazing story as well. And the characters are amazing story, uh, characters too. You put them all together and you've got a wonderful experience. So thank you very much, AJ Sam, for choosing me once again. You've got to get the book, Ibera. It's a journey far, so it means beginnings. That's the first one. If you'd like to get it, if you go into the description, if you're watching this on YouTube, in the description, there are all the links you need to click. You can download the book. It'll go straight into the device you're on and you can get it. There's also other links there to other stuff from AJ Sam. So do that now. And thank you once again, AJ. It's been brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant working with you. And, 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 and thank you for having me. And um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next chapter, the next chapter of our journey.